Hello, everyone. Welcome to those of you who are watching via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Please feel free to comment as to where you are watching from. We would love to know your location. And we are actually very happy that you are with us to celebrate Ludwig van Beethoven's 250th birthday. We are also grateful that we're able to continue our abruptly cut 2020-2021 cultural season. But here we are, we are watching online and we are grateful for that opportunity. We are grateful for the artists who have performed selected works of Beethoven for us to enjoy from their own studios, from the FE Auditorium, and in a combination of pre-recorded, pre-COVID videos, as well as a video specially made for this celebration. I am Martin Lopez, the director of FEU Center for the Arts, and I welcome you to our celebration of Beethoven's 250th anniversary. Feel free to comment below as you watch the performances. Stay on because afterwards we will have a short question and answer portion with some of the artists involved in the production. But if you have questions or comments as you watch, feel free to already write them down in the comment section, whether on Zoom or Facebook. With that, I am eager for all of us to start. Please ensure that you're on mute so that we can fully appreciate this uh, very simple concert that we have prepared for you. I will pass the screen then on to John Mark Isla for him to continue with our program. Again, thank you all for being here and we'll continue the discussion later. Martin Lopez. I'm the director of FEU's Center for the Arts. It is truly my pleasure to welcome you to the FEU Auditorium to close a tumultuous 2020 to celebrate the 250th birthday of Ludwig van Beethoven. It is my pleasure to introduce the artists for this afternoon's celebration. We start with the romance in F to be performed by violinist Joseph Brian Simafranca and pianist Madeline Jane Banta, both of whom have already performed in the FE Auditorium 
and it is a pleasure to welcome them back. From then, we proceed with the Waldstein Sonata to be performed by pianist Nathan Hemina. We will then close our very simple celebration with the Ode to Joy, which is how Music of Europa, the annual choral competition held here in this very auditorium, ends with all the choirs singing this wonderful piece from Beethoven's Symphony No. 9. We hope that you will enjoy this performance, this celebration. We hope that very soon we will all be able to witness live performances back here in the FE Auditorium. In the meantime, follow us on Facebook and on YouTube and see all the different performances we have prepared for you from the past years featuring our student artists but also the artists who we have invited to perform in this very very space the former cultural center of the philippines the feu auditorium stay safe be well happy birthday ludwig van beethoven
everyone, my name is Nathan Jimena and I am playing the Beethoven's Waldstein Sonata in C major and this is an interesting piece because not only is it one of Beethoven's biggest piano works, um, actually any sonata is very big already, but this one is actually dedicated to a person. That, that is why it's called the Waldstein Sonata. And he dedicated it to this person called Count Ferdinand von Waldstein, who was a big patron in Beethoven's life in his early years. So he was a big help to the career and life of Beethoven when he was very young. And this piece shows the explorative mind and spirit of Beethoven. Because although this piece is in C major, he goes to different keys that you wouldn't even imagine. And with that, I hope that you enjoy this rendition.
What is interesting about this second and third movement is they are two separate movements but they are somewhat joined together with the second movement being an introduction to the third movement. Initially, the second movement was supposed to be a quiet, lengthy set of variations but because of the length of the sonata and the disproportion of the character, Beethoven decided to rule it out and make it as another composition. And this introduction is much shorter and it opens to this beautiful third movement that represents heroism, triumph, and grandeur. I hope you enjoy.
you all enjoyed that short hour's worth of performances. And we will now open the floor to questions. But first, I would like to introduce our artists. We started the program with Beethoven's Romanza in F, featuring pianist Madeline Jane Banta, who was here earlier, but had to teach. So she will try to log on again later. And then the violinist for that performance was Joseph Brian Simafranca, who is unable to be with us this afternoon as he has another recording session, which is great that our artists have other things to do, that even while we are in quarantine, the music continues. Music making can continue. It does not have to be in the formal concert hall. It can also be in studios and even online. And then our next performer is Nathan Hemina, who is here this afternoon. Nathan, congratulations, well done. So we will have the chance to ask questions of him uh, shortly thereafter. And we ended the program with the choirs of Musica Firapa 10, the choral competition organized by FEU and the European Union in the Philippines represented here this afternoon by Thelma Hekulea. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Also in the audience, I'm seeing our former FEU president who hired me, Dr. Lydia Echaus, former president of the Friends for Cultural Concerns of the Philippines, Minerva Tanseco, who would help me bring audiences to FEU. The FCCP, incidentally, provided Nathan with his scholarship in UST and also provided a grant for pianist Jane Banta to do her master's in harp in the State University of New York. Also in the audience are another uh, excellent pianist herself, uh, Marielle Ilosorio, who just finished recording Beethoven sonatas as part of the celebrations for Beethoven's 250th anniversary. We have uh, members of the FEU community, our students, our student artists from the FEU Center for the Arts. Thank you all for being here. Now I will turn the floor over to whoever wants to ask questions of me or of Nathan um, or any of the topics we talked about, Musica of Europa, uh, Thelma is here as well. Um, and then, of course, my own team, May Narida and John Mark Isla, and congratulations especially to JM for stitching all of the, the programs together for the program notes and for controlling the tech for our Zoom this afternoon. Now, there's a question from Nathan's mom. Mrs. Hamina asks, how... Do you plan to spread the love for classical music to a greater degree among young people today? I am blessed that in FEU we get to program these kinds of events into our cultural season, whether live or online, and that these kinds of programs do get integrated into the academic program. Hopefully through that, we are able to instill and develop that love for classical music, especially among the FU audiences. But beyond that, our programs are always open to anyone who wants to come and watch them. In the past, of course, you'd have to come to FU, but now there is really no barrier to watching these kinds of programs because we're watching them online. We have an alum watching from Nevada. You can watch anywhere at any time, and hopefully other presenters will be able to do the same and share their programs and share their artists and the, the wonderful work of these amazing artists. It's uh, something also you commented about in terms of the text that accompanied the performance and we feel that that would be one way to also educate and enlighten our audiences and make them more appreciative of uh, the nuances in classical music what is a trill? What is an octave? Uh, what was in Beethoven's mind when 
he composed these pieces. Normally, if you're in a concert hall, you have a souvenir program, but it's too dark to read. And sometimes you have to pay for your souvenir program, which costs a lot. So we figured, you know, let us make our performances educational and entertaining. So it's educational, it's entertaining, um, it's edutainment, educational entertainment. And uh, uh, that's just one small way which we hope that uh, we're able to reach out to younger audiences. And, and there are many of you here who are teachers and uh, you're artists yourselves and you're reaching out to different sets of audiences. And I think that's a wonderful um, thing that you're all doing. And um, we have to constantly look for other platforms to ensure that uh, younger audiences um, get exposed. I think that exposure is also very important. So we also have the concerts group on Facebook, which this program will eventually end up on. And it's a platform to be able to promote all kinds of music and dance concerts. It started out in Metro Manila, but now it can really be online and anywhere. So for you artists out there, feel free to also use that platform to reach a greater audience. And if you know other people who want to be part of that community, feel free to add them too. And then also in FU, we have seven cultural groups that provide scholarships to artists who are able to blend and balance their passion and desire for learning their particular craft and also their academics. We have the bamboo band, we have the chorale, the dance company, the drum and bugle corps, the drummers, the guides, and the theater guild. And none of these students are majors in theater, music, or dance because we don't have those majors. They are majors in business, in nursing, in the fine arts, in architecture, and on top of their very rigorous academic program, they still commit to 12 hours every week to learn theater, dance, or music, or the history of FU and the arts. And even online, that is still part of their requirements. And so somehow we hope that through these extracurricular activities, they are also able to develop their own awareness and appreciation of the various art forms. Nathan, there's a question on how you chose your piece and how you prepared for it. Oh, hello. Uh, but first and foremost, thank you, FU. Thank you, Sir Martin, for giving me the opportunity to perform for everyone in light of celebrating Beethoven's life. Um, that, the question is, how, how did I come to this? And how did I prepare for it? But actually, it was given to me as, a, as an assignment. So I've been, I've been studying piano for more than a decade already. And when I was in high school, one of my mentors, uh, Miss Perla Suaco, who uh, may she rest in peace, gave this to me. And it, just like what I said in the comments below, it's very dear to me because she, was, uh, sh she gave that to me as our final sonata to study together before I went to college. And um, it was really, it actually took me a year just to, just to study that with her. And then bringing, bringing it back again was such a thrill to, to look back and see, uh, see all of this, the, these things again. Uh, and all the memories are flooding back already. And <laughs> how I prepared for it was, well, of course, it's somehow, somehow in the back of my mind already. But technically, of course, I would put in the hours, I would uh, research and read again about it. And it's interesting because if you play something, uh, even if you're uh, um, any kind of musician, maybe you're, uh, maybe you're a drummer or maybe you're a pianist or maybe you're even a singer, is that when you go back to old pieces, you never play it the same again. And I think that's the beauty of what music making can do and why everyone should have a taste of it, even though they don't take it for their, uh, for their college or degree or whatever. And 
you know, you just learn something not just about the composer, but about you also. And I guess that's one of the beauties of being a musician is that as you study the compositions of, of other people, you learn more about yourself. So for me, it was a lot of learning about myself, my, my abilities and my limitations as well. So I guess preparing for something like this is first and foremost, it's a privilege. <laughs> That's what I can say. A privilege not just to be here for FEU, but just to share music to other people and good music at that. And I, I guess another thing about the preparation is uh, how I prepared for it is I know that this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to share, especially at this time where we're all, we're all separated from each other. And that's why something like this is a really great blessing because we can, we can have that opportunity to share in that, that love and fascination for something despite being apart. So thank you for that question. And uh, I hope you're somehow enlightened by uh, my, my findings in my journey. Yeah. Can we do a quick poll? Like how many here are, are musicians, are performing artists, are teachers, or students? Just uh, raise your hand, use the uh, reaction button and either use the thumbs up. Okay, I'm starting to see. Okay, very good. You musicians then might have music related questions for Nathan, which I'm sure he would love to answer. So feel free to post your 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 questions um, in the in the chats. Nathan, another question for you is now that you've finished your your studies in UST, you graduated cum laude, you're teaching now, I understand. What do you want to do after? What do you do with that knowledge and how do you push yourself forward? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, I guess what I want to do with what I've learned is, of course, I want to pass it to other people. And that's the reason why I... I I'm a teacher right now. I, in fact, I teach in our school. It's called Acts Manila. And we don't just teach music. We actually teach dance. And we uh, teach other instruments as well. And uh, that's, that school is owned by my family. And that's, I guess that's one thing that, that's the vision that we have for, for artists in general. Is that we want to, we want to raise artists of, that, that exceed excellence and that will go out to the world and share what we have. And yeah, I, I guess that's, that's one thing I, I want to do. And if not, for, if not for the people who have taught me, talking about my teachers and my professors, to name a few, even Sir Anthony, who's, who's here, and uh, Maria, they, they taught me so much <laughs> along my journey and that I thank them for. And w without the impact of teachers, I don't think I would have, or I don't think I would be here today, actually. It's the effect of someone's life and someone's passion that is so contagious that it would go on to you. And I don't think, I, I don't know where I would be without those kinds of people. And specifically, and going back to my, my other mentors as well, they, they brought me to where I am today. And I feel like if we, have, if we have a world where we have teachers and people who can inspire through their passion rather than just doing the job, then we would have wonderful musicians. And that's what I started to do. Yeah. Carry on. You're doing a great job. I will throw your mom's question back to you. How do you plan to spread the love of classical music to a greater degree among younger people today because especially like you're from a younger generation 
you're re reaching out to an even younger generation, how do you make classical music a part of their lives? I, that's a great question. Uh, other, than, other than the teaching part, I think it's also something that we have to do together as a collective. It's, I think it, the, the mission for sharing music is so big that one person is not enough. And that's the great thing about it is that we will never be just one person in this kind of mission. And I, I think that's the power of having specifically one-on-one -on -one lessons with someone is that not only do you pass down your knowledge, but you actually build a relationship with your teacher. Like for example, my, I, I love my, my mentors very much from uh, teacher John Lorico to Ms. Perla Swaco, even now to Dr. Raul Sunico, who's my current mentor now, uh, and even my other professors in USD. They, they, they have been amazing. And, you know, I guess, I guess it's something that is difficult to do, especially in this time, but it's not impossible. It's never impossible. And, you know, as the efforts of FEU right now, it's just one of the, it's just part of the big picture in getting uh, the music out of there. And I guess really the most important thing that I think uh, what we could do in getting uh, classical music out of there is not, it's, it's not the music itself, but it's what it can do to our lives. I think that's what's most important. So for Beethoven, let's say Beethoven, for example, you would call him a tr transitional composer. And he, he had so much revolutionary ideas, especially with his sonatas. And you can see the progression and what he wanted to do. He, he paved the way for so many other composers to, to explore uh, and not just be confined with the limitations of, their, uh, of the norm, of the instrument and all. And... How does that affect our life today, right? I mean, it, it's never just boxed around the music, but music, actually, it affects our lives. It affects our lifestyle, and therefore, it affects how we treat each other. And that's, I guess that's one vision that I would want to see in other people, in other musicians, especially the ones that I myself am raising. So, yeah, thanks for that question. That's a very good one. How do you teach online? Like, what are the challenges you face in a field where you're supposed to really be side by side? Now you are screen to screen. <laughs> yeah, that that is also an important one. Although I'm, I I have been doing it already for, uh, uh, of course, ever since the pandemic started, and it's really a challenge, especially if you're teaching to seven-year-olds who sometimes get lost <laughs> get lost in their own thought and they can't see what you're doing so but i guess if you really want something to happen there will always be a way so in online teaching i think one thing that you really need is patience knowing that this situation that we have now is just temporary and it just because well i have talked to some people who have or rather just one, who shockingly stopped teaching piano because she said that it was impossible to do it online. And, you know, for me, I don't think it will hinder anyone wanting to learn music just because the situation does not call it. I mean, that, I think that's the truth. That's the, one of the natures of, of us humans is that we always find ways. Or rather, that sounds like BDO, but yeah, we find ways. <laughs> yeah. And I guess it's just about the, of course, I, I don't dismiss the technicals part, but I think you can get all the technicals down, but you can still be frustrated with, with everything, with the, the online part. But this is actually a proof already that, you know, we can, we can find a way to do what we, what we wish. This concert, it happened. It could have been an FU, but we can't, and that's the truth. But it happened, and we are all, all here today. We're sharing this love and fascination for Beethoven. So it's difficult to do an online class, but it's not impossible, and something will come out of it eventually. 
as you said, uh, we find ways, even if we're not sponsored by BDO. But yes, we find ways. <laughs> yeah. And on that note, you know, um, there are members of the audience now who come from the FU Bamboo Band. They're a very unique ensemble of bamboo instruments, and they play classical music and OPM and Christmas and Broadway and the like. But that involves getting together in person to rehearse. Now, how do you do that when you're in quarantine and you don't have your instruments because they couldn't bring their instruments home and some of them really cannot bring their instruments out of the studio? So some of them were very creative and made their own set of instruments out of PVC pipes. And they found ways to be able to continue practicing. And if you look up their YouTube channels, this is the FU Bamboo Band, or also through the FU Center for the Arts, you will see their rendition of Carol of the Bells, which will premiere Naman tomorrow. And it was just so spectacular to watch how they were able to put that all together. And again, finding ways and other orchestras have found ways to be able to continue performing and playing and rehearsing online. And earlier I mentioned uh, Marielle Illusorio's uh, series of Beethoven sonatas, which she and her students got to, to rehearse and perform, and it's now available also on the concerts group on Facebook for you all to watch. But these are just examples of musicians or artists, really, for that matter, getting together and continuing to excel and to hone their craft, no matter what the limitations are. And I think that is something that adds to the performance that it's not just a random piece or a random production, but something that they had to exert a lot of effort and sacrifice to make that performance happen because they had to hurdle a lot of challenges, especially rehearsing and performing online. So bravo to all of you artists who are continuing um, your wonderful work and carry on and continue to hone and develop yourselves. Might there be other questions or comments for Nathan or the other wonderful artists who are here um, joining us on Zoom? Actually, for those who are joining us on Facebook, feel free to, to type out your comments and those will be read to us also by May and by JM. Nathan also had a performance, uh, what, about a month ago, right? Performing Oh Holy Night for uh, Assumption class of 68 or 69. It was their class project to entertain not just themselves, but their families. And they posted it on YouTube and it has over a thousand likes, you know, it's uh, and a thousand views. So Nathan was part of that and so was Joe Bry our violinist earlier for the Romanza. Hi, Martin. Hi, me? Mickey. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I have a question for Nathan. Not really a question, but I just wanted uh, the, his thoughts on is uh, music something very human, no? Something very personal and his thoughts on technology coming into the scene. Because I saw a feature on um, a computer challenging a man on classical music composing. And the computer was quite good, uh, taking all the algorithms of um, other classical music put together, and the computer was able to, put, to come up with something quite nice also. No? So what are his thoughts on, on that? music is something from the heart and being human? Wow, that's a great question, Sir Mickey. Um, I do believe, though, uh, just to put it out there, that music and technology, generally, they can go together. 
In fact, my brother is a musician and he is a music producer right now. He graduated from, uh, from College of St. Benild. And he uses technology in his music and that's his job. He, he, he has songs that come in and then he, he puts them to studio level. Now, I'm not sure about, I, I think what you're talking about, sir, Mickey, is maybe AI, uh, artificial, yes, intelligence, artificial intelligence. Making, Correct. Yeah, but I'm actually not sure about that. But I guess if an AI makes it, Yes, it can be impressive, but it's not coming from somewhere. They can make something so great, but let's say with the emotion behind it and with the idea, it's, it's not coming from somewhere. That's just me and that's just how I see it. But how I feel when I listen to compositions by other people is that I get to relate to them. Uh, maybe if it's in an, an emotional way, an exciting way, in an, a turbulent way, and and looking at the life of whatever, whoever the composer is, you can see where that person is coming from. But I guess if an AI makes a composition, yes, it can be impressive. It could be nice technically and uh, theory-wise. But I think it would just go there. I'm sorry, I, I haven't heard actually a composition by... AI. I'm just um, I'm just assuming I'm just assuming that that would be it. But I, I would rather listen to something that I know is created by by a human. <laughs> I mean, it's something when we share music, it's something that we relate to, kind of like where the word relationship comes from. There is a relationship between the audience and the performer. There is a relationship between even theoretically from note to note. There is actually a relationship. So. Actually, all of this is about relationships, whether you, whether you, however you see it. So the relationship with an AI to a human, that's something interesting, and I would like to learn more. Um, but as of now, I think I would be good with just listening to the, the classic Beethoven and Chopin, and even even pop, like um, Bruno Mars, Michael Jackson. It's it's all music. So, yeah, that would be my thoughts for it. Thank you. We have a question from Krenz. Krenz, do you want to ask your question in person? Uh, yes, well, um, hello, po. good afternoon, po, sir. Um, I would just like to ask, uh, how do you personally relate to the pieces that you study? Can you tell us from which cultural group you're from? FEU Coral po. From FEU Coral. Thank you. Nathan, go ahead. So how do I relate to... The pieces the, that you study, yes. pieces that I study. I think it's a combination. Like, um, I, I would say that the combination of knowing, knowing the history of it, knowing its use, and what it was meant for, and along with the the musical knowledge that that I would have, it it all comes into play because I hear I hear pianists play so much beautiful music, but they don't understand the thing about notes, or they don't understand the thing about music theory. But they play so beautifully. Now, I I think that with with playing uh, maybe a composition, let's say with Beethoven you could relate to it, but if you don't know anything about Beethoven or theory, you could still enjoy it. And I guess that's the thing that comes into play about music being a universal language, that you don't... I, I, I think some would disagree with me, like you don't need to understand what's going on to enjoy it. But understanding the piece enhances the enjoyment. I guess that's what would make it and all of these things music theory history uh all these appreciation things and that's what i hold dearly from from all the those classes that i've taken in the university of santo thomas is that i've learned so much and it it actually piles up and it's 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 now part of it it comes out it comes out in your play and yeah that's how i see it but you know something else that i'd like to add is that you looked at also the history 
of maybe the composer and you put that in relation to the piece that he composed and let's say Beethoven's time when he was writing, there was a lot of things that was happening in Europe. So it was not just what was happening to him, he was losing his hearing and he composed the symphony number nine, the Ode to Joy, and he couldn't hear what he was um, composing. It was just all in his head. He could hear it there, but he couldn't hear it live. You, could, you look at also at uh, what was happening politically in terms of his country, the, the, the empire and all that. And you talk about, let's say, maybe heroism in, in your piece, right? Um, in, the, in the sonata. Uh, why talk about heroism? Because politically at that time, they also needed to be brave, which is one of our taglines in FEU um, because of what was happening politically. So having that in mind, you then hear certain passages like what Nathan played. And um, I think actually those uh, program notes placed exactly where they needed to be help in understanding, okay, look, we're changing from the slow movement, it's now going to the heroic movement. And I think even the the the, the, quad, the, the notes um, change, you feel lighter all of a sudden from the second to the third movement. Um, but that is also because those explanations help. I'm like, oh yeah, that, that, that does make sense. I hear it, but I'm also reading it. And that to me was very helpful. And I think that's, one way of how to be able to relate to the piece when you know the history behind it, when you know um, why the composer composed it. It's not just random notes put together. Oh, it sounds nice. No, there is definitely a reason for that. Hope that sort of helped, Krenz. And yes, maybe also different, like um, as a chorale member, when you're learning a foreign piece, you have to also understand what the foreign words are. So like in that Ode to Joy, when they were singing in German um, versus, it made more sense to also sing it in German, but that's why we also provided the translation so that everyone can, can understand it and uh, why it's become such a popular piece or why the EU chose it to become their um, national anthem. So it's important to study um, even the, the words behind the notes and then try to put yourself in that piece in that context mm -hmm. so that you can have those emotions because I, I think with music you cannot or actually with arts you cannot control your emotions you, you have to you know, let it out show it whether it's the way you play the way you move together with with the piece or whether how you sing can also make a, a difference right Okay, next question again for you, Nathan, is do you have any other books you use for exercises aside from Hanun and Zerny? Uh, I, I was taught traditionally, so I did use Hanun and Zerny. So, but I think another popular one that you could try is the Moskowski Etudes. A lot, uh, some of my classmates actually used Moskowski Etudes. And they're very, very wonderful compositions. You could actually use them for performances as well. Um, yeah, but I am a, I'm a Cherny kid, <laughs> actually. And yeah, actually, I, I also used uh, J.B. Kramer Etudes. They're a set of 50 studies. And I also, I, I took them, I, I took them and they, they helped me quite a lot as well. So you might want to look into that also. And um these exercises, they are, they are a staple in, in piano playing. So I encourage you to, to still go through those. They are quite helpful and very, very helpful. Yeah. Nathan, if you don't mind just uh, putting that in the comment box also so that uh, it's in writing sure, sure. and they can, they can read about it later. We have time probably for just one more question or comment. Or maybe Nathan, might you have a question for any of the audience? Uh, 
Oh, that that would be interesting if I had a question. Let me <laughs> let me let me think for a couple of seconds. <laughs> Okay. Do we have a question from Jefferson? No? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Actually, um, I would... Is it, is it his dream? Is it your dream to have a concert abroad? Uh, yes, sir. That would, be, that would be a privilege to have. That I actually do wish to study even more <laughs> and pursue, pursue a higher degree. For that, I, I love learning. I love playing the piano. So why not? <laughs> yeah. You were not forced to play the piano when you were young. I was actually forced to play the piano for a for for the first, I would say first three four years. Four and years, the, yes. Yeah, and then with the influence of some friends who love classical music, and then. Uh, just constantly learning about it, I, I found that oh, this this actually is, is amazing. And yeah, I guess for the ball to be rolling, it just takes a little push. Not for yes. all people, but for some. That's me included. Like now, I'm forcing all my grandchildren to play the piano. I give money <laughs> if they can play a piece for me. Wow. <laughs> Bribery always works. <laughs> I, I hope one day that they will be thankful, thankful for that gesture. <laughs> yeah. I love I love piano. I love classical music. That's very nice. Now, actually, it's Thank interesting because growing up, um, so my grandfather was a cellist and his whole siblings, all his siblings played some kind of instrument and they had to practice their respective instruments before they could even go to school. So that meant waking up at like five in the morning. This was in Iloilo. And then my grandfather's brother became, a, he was a violinist. And I remember um, I also had to learn the piano. In fact, I learned on that, this piano right there. And um, at first I didn't like being forced into it, but then the, the interest, um, <laughs> gradually took over being forced. But my grandfather's brother would um, visit and he would ask me questions like, um, how many hours did you practice today? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> one, and shake, shaking. And then okay, you have to practice more. A good musician, you need to practice four to eight hours a day. I'm like, uh, I was like six or seven years old and that was just so terrifying. But then when he saw I was like shaking and like so nervous, then he would give me money. I'm like, oh, okay, sure, okay. And he said, he'll give me a bigger amount if I practice even more. It kind of worked. May I yeah. interject, Martin? Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I don't mean to upstage my son. Okay, but I just wanted to say uh, that a comment about practicing and forcing, let's say, pianist. To, I guess that was me, right? Because I'm the mom. <laughs> but I think because our art... Okay, including mine, like ballet and all the classical arts, take a lot of discipline to do. It takes a, it takes a little bit of a push because I do recall having one, one mentor who was an American in some other area who said that she wishes that her mom had pushed her because she regrets not having pursued her piano lessons to the degree that she could have taken it farther. So I think that it's important for us to, to understand that because our art is very specialized, it, it, takes a, it takes a while to fall in love with whatever instrument naturally. And we, we need to reach a point where we are a little bit of an expert or excellent at it before we discover that, hey, this is, in fact, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Because initially, you do what? Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, do. Or you do the, in ballet, we do the day in, day out. But after a while, maybe after three years, it becomes, mm -hmm. it becomes music. And so, the breakthrough comes only after a while. So maybe that, that justifies a little bit of the push from the mommies or the daddies. Thank you.
Thank you for doing that too. Thank you. Um, in fact, we have a comment here um, from Karen who said she wishes her parents forced her to. Um, but you know what? It's really, it's never too late. And we keep excelling and we keep pushing ourselves. Just like Nathan, as accomplished as he is already, he still wants to um, develop his skills further and maybe go to the next level of education, of improving as a musician, as a pianist. So we have to keep pushing ourselves to, to learn. And it also keeps the, the brain active and uh, definitely helps deter like Alzheimer's or, or other kinds of uh, debilitating diseases when you are really focused on your particular art or craft. So yes, it's never too late to learn. And then, and thank you, Cello, for sharing. And thank you for, for raising up not just Nathan, but your, your kids to, to be musicians too. And to also to the kids who are in your school, because you're nurturing them too. And yes, that's, that's where some teachers... Of our, some of our directors in ballet are here. John Manlapi is here. The Artistic Associate of Axman is here at Estirol. So, you know, we have full force. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you. great, thank great. You. And actually, we've come to the point that uh, we will have to end our tribute to Beethoven. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you to our artists once again, to Joseph Bryan Simafranca, to Madeline Jane Banta, to Alvin Paulin, and the different choirs of Musica Europa. Thank you to my team at the FU Center for the Arts, especially May Narita and John Mark Isla. We hope that uh, you'll continue to follow us on Facebook and YouTube, see those other performances that we've already posted. Our cultural groups have been very busy over quarantine and have been very productive. So catch their productions that are already posted on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Groups like the FU Bamboo Band have their own um, YouTube channels. Um, FU is part of the Association of Cultural Offices and Philippine Educational Institute, uh, Institutions. And tomorrow we will have a webinar, uh, Chikang Steening, to especially talk about teachers of the arts who unfortunately have lost their jobs because of the pandemic. Maybe they've gone on furlough, maybe their, their arts offices have closed. We in FU are very lucky and we're very grateful to our management for supporting and continuing to support the arts. Other schools are not as lucky. If you know of any teachers who are in that boat, they might want to attend tomorrow's webinar. We have a lot of inspirational speakers. Check out the Acopay Facebook group and page to just see some of those inspirational messages from the likes of Lisa Makuha Elizalde from um, Ligaya, Fernando Amil Bangsa, from Maribel Ligarda of PETA, from Ben and Ben. So these are just some of the artists and groups that will be speaking or giving words of inspiration tomorrow. But we'll also find out from these different teachers how they've been able to transcend the challenges. What did they do? Did they take on a different uh, career? Are they still teaching? Some of them are now baking, just like uh, Joe Bry actually bakes fantastic choco banana bread loaves, which you might all want to try. I, I know some in the audience have already tried it. Um, what other things have these uh, teachers and arts uh, practitioners done in the wake of this quarantine? So that's tomorrow at three o'clock uh, via Zoom and also on Facebook. And then on Sunday, I have a personal project, which is my Come to the Stable Christmas concert, my annual Christmas gift to family, friends, followers, and friends of music has been this concert called Come to the Stable. It's now in its 20th year, and we're celebrating it on December 20, 2020 at 2000. And it will also feature the FU Bamboo Band and the FU Chorale, among many, 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 many other artists who have participated in Come to the Stable in the last 20 years and that will be on Zoom, Facebook and YouTube and more information will be 
post it on the concerts page tomorrow. With that, um, thank you once again. For those of you who want to watch the concert again, Beethoven's Tribute will be on the Facebook page of the FU Center for the Arts, as well as our YouTube channel. You know, when you watch it again, you might see and hear something differently, a different passage or a different interpretation, or you didn't hear it the first time, you might hear it again the second time, or however many times you watch it. And feel free to invite other people to watch as well, because this has been a really simple but beautiful and heartfelt tribute to Ludwig van Beethoven on his 250th anniversary. With that, I also wish you Merry Christmas. Take care, everybody. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Martin. Ethan, bravo. <laughs> Thank you very much, too. Yeah. Thank Looking you. forward to your next productions. Yes, yes. Looking forward Live to... Live na next time in the FU Auditorium, ah. Yes, when everything is okay. <laughs> Absolutely. And we hope that will be sooner than later. Yeah, I hope so too. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care. Bye.